Hello class and welcome to part two of our virus and bacterial lecture uh, over the PowerPoint and note outline for this week, this week five of distance learning. So I'm going to pick up where, where we left off, where we left off talking about viruses and hopefully by now you have a good understanding between lytic and lysogenic cycle, reproductive cycles. Once again, the lytic cycle causing the cell to die pretty much right away within hours. Or lysogenic, it kind of hides itself in there inside the host chromosome for a while, possibly for a long time, but then it could possibly actually go into the lytic cycle. So make sure you go back and review. But guys, what I want to do is start off this lecture by giving you a review questions. Let's see if you, you know, been doing your Khan Academy lessons, maybe knowing a little bit more than viruses just besides the reproductive actual cycles that we've talked about. So here's a good review question, a quiz like question. So guys, looking at this question here, uh, notice we have uh, three pictures of three different viruses. So your first question, which of the following above is a bacterial phage? So I'll give you uh, maybe a minute to think about it. Do, 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 do. do, 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 do. Okay, well, that's enough of that. Guys, hopefully you looked at these three pictures and this one right here, number three is the bacterial phage. This shape makes it specific to attacking just bacteria. Uh, question number two, which above have glycoproteins? So these viruses up here, which of them are kind of possibly showing glycoprotein? So you have to know what a glycoprotein is. I'll give you maybe a couple seconds to think about it. Do, 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 do. Okay, I think that's enough. Guys, hopefully you said one and two, one and two. Guys, these things right here, these are called glycoproteins. We see them right here, number two, a spherical virus and an adrenal virus here. Glycoproteins are these receptors that we find in viruses that make them specific to maybe attacking a specific host cell. So once again, two and one right here, these would have glycoproteins. So Hopefully go back, guys, do the Khan Academy lessons. They actually give you a little bit more information than I did on this PowerPoint about the structure of a virus. Very simple structure, but you should know those components. Well, guys, let's pick off where we left off. We left off mostly focusing on bacterial phages, these right here, and how they attack bacteria. They could do the lytic, lysogenic cycle. Guys, let's focus now, though, click on this. Let's focus on viruses that attack more eukaryotic cells, specifically animal cells. So many viruses that infect animal cells tend to have this extra, you know, they have a capsid, a protein coat, but outside the protein coat, they have a membranous envelope. In other words, they have a lipid bilayer outside. Um, and guys, this makes it specific to possibly attacking animal cells. Uh, they usually also tend to have viral glycoproteins on the envelope that bind to specific receptors that kind of trick animal cells into thinking it might be something it might need, maybe a piece of food, or maybe thinking that it's going to be engulfing it, something that it's going to be able to destroy. Uh, and actually some of these viral envelopes and glycoproteins are actually thrown from the whole cell as it's exiting. You'll kind of see that as these capsids kind of exit the cycle once it's actually been infected. So to really understand this, let's look at some pictures. So here we have an example of a viral envelope virus. Um, and this one's an example of possibly a retrovirus, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a couple minutes. But notice here we have a spherical virus. It enters the cell. It can either get engulfed in uh, and put into a little vesicle, or sometimes it just kind of passes right through. And then usually the capsid disintegrates. You have your viral genome, uh, either DNA or RNA, and then it starts just making copies of itself. It starts making copies of all of its components, uh, copies of its RNA or DNA, copies of its capsid, copies of the glycoproteins, the receptors. And then notice what happens. As it leaves, it takes part of the cell membrane of the host cell. This is going to allow it to infect those cells, those animal cells, a lot easier because now they're also going to have a lot of receptors that are animal receptors. So those cells nearby are going to think, oh, this is my own cell. Uh, you know, they're part of me and they're going to be able to engulf it pretty easily. Um, let's look at a, another picture here. Guys, we have the same thing. Uh, 
all your kind of different steps. You have your, uh, sometimes it's called invagination, but pretty much it's the same thing as entry. This one, notice how it's put into a vesicle, uh, sometimes referred to as an endosome. And then you're going to have usually that cell start to break apart where just the viral DNA is in there. And now it's going to start making copies of itself, making copies of the glycoproteins, making copies of the capsid. It starts to assemble themselves and then they exit with part of the membrane of the host cell. So what I wanna do is show you a little video that hopefully will once again, just give you a better time understanding this. So, um, so this is gonna look at the viral life cycle, but looking at those that attack mostly animal cells. You probably already know that viruses are responsible for causing a number of diseases, from AIDS to the flu. But did you ever wonder how a virus works? Viruses are basically infectious particles that take over the operation of a cell for the sole purpose of manufacturing new viruses. How exactly does a virus do this? In many ways, it works in the same manner as a computer virus does. It has to first gain access and then convince the machinery within the device in this case a cell, to make multiple new copies of the virus. There are many different types of viruses, but they do share some similar characteristics. First of all, viruses are usually specific in the types of cells that they infect. The specificity of a virus is dependent upon the types of receptors that are found on the surface of the target cell. Every cell in your body has a pattern of protein receptors on its surface. The virus uses these proteins to target specific cells for infection. In this example, the genetic material of the virus infecting the cell is DNA. However, unlike the complex DNA found in the nucleus of the cell, the DNA of a virus is relatively simple and just contains the information needed to manufacture new virus parts. Once inside the cell, the instructions in the DNA are transcribed to RNA. The protein building machinery of the host cell then translates these instructions. In okay, just pausing here because once again, you see the first three steps and let me move my little picture of myself. Uh, you have attachment, entry, you had replication. Once again, it starts making mRNA. Now it's gonna start doing biosynthesis, making all of its components. Into the components of a new virus. These parts are then assembled into new viruses within the host cell. When ready, they emerge from the host cell, often killing it in the process. As they emerge, so oh, let me move my picture again. So notice as they emerge out, they're gonna be taking the part of the plasma membrane of that host cell. And once again, this allows it to infect other cells uh, a lot more easier. Oops. Some viruses retain parts of the host cell membrane, forming an envelope around the virus. This envelope gives some protection to the virus from the immune system of the host organism. Each new virus is now capable of infecting another host cell and repeating the process of virus replication. By understanding how the life cycle of a virus works, scientists have been able to develop antiviral drugs that target specific points in the- Oh, to keep on moving it right to where I am. Let me move that over here. Virus life cycle and thus prevent the virus from replicating. Okay, so that was our first video. Once again, that's showing um, an animal virus. That's a DNA um, made animal virus. But something I wanna talk about, something that it's not specifically uh, mentioned in the PowerPoint, but it's something you definitely need to know about is retroviruses and guys, when it comes to vetro, uh, retroviruses, what you need to know, and this is in your chapter 19 reading, is that retroviruses are those viruses that instead of DNA, they actually have a piece of RNA and they also have an enzyme. They have one enzyme there called a reverse transcriptase. So remember that, reverse transcriptase. They have that one enzyme in there and they have a strand of RNA, a single strand of RNA. So what happens when they get engulfed, the capsid gets disintegrated, you have a piece of RNA, a strand of RNA that's single-stranded, 
what happens that reverse transcriptase will bind to the RNA. And guys, it's a retrovirus. Retro means backwards. So it's going to work backwards. It's actually going to make DNA from the single-stranded RNA. Reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that will bind to it, make actual DNA, two strands of DNA from that RNA, and it becomes a double-stranded RNA molecule. So that's kind of the one big difference between them. Our most common example of a retrovirus, our most popular retrovirus, is that of HIV. HIV is a retrovirus. So let me show you a picture of what that looks like. Uh, this is not in your notes. I just put this on there for um, this slide, but it's from Khan Academy. So if you go to Khan Academy and look at retroviruses, you'll find it. So here's our HIV virus up here. It has RNA, single strand RNA, and it has an enzyme called tra uh, reverse transcriptase. And once again, remember that enzyme, reverse transcriptase. It makes sense, reverse transcriptase. So it's going to kind of reverse and make DNA from RNA. So notice you have attachment, you have entry, the capsule disintegrates, and then right here, it makes a copy of DNA, double-stranded DNA from that messenger RNA. And for HIV, that DNA actually incorporates itself into the chromosome of an animal cell. So that's a chromosome, it puts it in there, and that's what we call a provirus. Remember, the difference between a provirus and a prophage is proviruses is that viral DNA that integrates into an animal cell, a eukaryotic cell. If this was a bacteria, then we would call this a prophage. But nope, this is an animal cell, so we call this a provirus. And then from there, it could always start making copies of itself, slowly killing that cell, robbing it of all of its resources, making more copies of that virus. Guys, I know that's a little rough explanation. Let me show you a video, another video, that kind of goes over how reverse um, transcriptase works, how retroviruses work. So let me pull that up for you guys. Okay, so guys, this is a really cool, it's short, it's not very long, but it kind of gives you a good um, visual feel for what a retrovirus is. Retroviruses are enveloped viruses. The virion carries two copies of single-stranded RNA plus the enzyme reverse transcriptase. When the virus enters the cell, the single-stranded RNA and reverse transcriptase are released inside the cell. The single-stranded RNA is converted to double-stranded DNA by the enzyme reverse transcriptase. The double-stranded DNA is integrated into the host cell's chromosome as a provirus. Some cells carry the provirus in the latent state and no virions are produced, whereas other infected cells continuously synthesize new virions. The viral DNA is transcribed to produce one long polygenic messenger RNA. The messenger RNA is translated onto a long polyprotein, which is then cleaved by a viral encoded protease to yield the individual proteins that make up the virion. Okay, so notice right here, it transcribed it and it made all of its parts. It made kind of its receptor protein, the capsid, the reverse transcriptase. It's also still making the DNA uh, or the RNA that will be all put together and then go into uh, that lytic cycle where it's gonna start making components, assembling itself. So uh, guys, hopefully this was pretty easy to understand. The main thing to remember about retroviruses is that it's RNA. It's, a, it's not DNA that's inside the virus, it's RNA, and it has an enzyme, remember the name of the enzyme, reverse transcriptase, and that allows it to make DNA from the RNA that it's injecting. So that's kind of the key component there to remember. So hopefully that helps you with your understanding of retroviruses, very basic knowledge that we need to understand. So guys, now we're switching. Okay, that was all about viruses. Let's talk about bacteria. And we just need some basic information about bacteria. First of all, its structure, which we've actually talked a little bit about when we covered cells. Now, bacteria, once again, these are prokaryotic cells. They don't have a nucleus, no nucleus. Here's a picture with the basic structure of a bacteria cell. It has DNA, usually, once again, just one circular piece of DNA. And then it has ribosomes. 
and that's pretty much it. That's it. Notice no, no other organelles in there. You don't see mitochondria. You don't see an ER or a Golgi. You do see cytoplasm, the fluid that the DNA kind of just swims in, all the ribosomes in. You see a uh, plasma membrane here in yellow. You see a cell wall here in red. And then some bacteria have this extra um, outer covering called a capsule that's outside their cell wall. And then they usually tend to have a flagella. They tend to have, not all bacteria, but some will have a flagella, this long whip-like structure that helps them move in their environment. Then they have these other hair-like structures. These are not flagella. These are called pili or a pilus. They're used for bacterial sex, which we're going to talk about. And not all bacteria might have pili. So let's look at a little bit of information about bacteria structure. Now, when it comes to bacteria, remember there's two kingdoms of bacteria. There's kingdom bacteria, or sometimes called eubacteria, and kingdom archaea. The difference between these two kingdoms depends if they end up being what we call gram-positive bacteria or gram-negative bacteria. Now, gram-positive bacteria, this makes up all those bacteria that are in kingdom eubacteria. This is most typical bacteria, like the E. coli that we have in our gut, the E. coli that we find all around our home, all over, pretty much all over. The most typical bacteria are gram positive. And guys, this is what their uh, structure looks like. They have a plasma membrane, and then they have a cell wall that's a, pi uh, a peptoglycan layer. And notice it's pretty thick. So the reason we call them gram positive is that we use this uh, dye called crystal violet to kind of dye it, and it's gonna stain it, and it's gonna stain uh, kind of a dark purplish kind of stain. Uh, and you kind of see it right here. And it's because of this peptoglycan layer, because it's so thick, it absorbs that crystal violet. Now, notice, though, those that stain gram-negative. They have a plasma membrane, just like this one. They have a peptoglycan layer, but notice that difference. It's really thin compared to this one here. And then they have an extra kind of outer covering. And that extra outer covering is usually called a lipopolysaccharide. It's kind of like this extra sugary, fatty material outside. And that's what our kingdom archaea is made up of. And usually, once again, these bacteria that live in this archaea kingdom, that are part of this archaea kingdom, are bacteria that live in extreme environments, like really hot environments, very acidic environments, very uh, acidic, uh, once again, probably said acidic, but very salty environments as well. And this extra outer covering kind of helps them survive in those environments. So that's something to definitely know is between bacteria, you could either have gram positive, which is your bacteria kingdom or gram negative which is their archaea and the difference is really this outer covering outside the peptoglycan layer called a lipopolysaccharide that's kind of the big difference kind of remember that now here's a cool picture of the flagella and i just want to show this because when it comes to this flagella and the structure the motor protein that kind of makes it work because the way a flagella works it turns like a corkscrew and guys, this is an electron picture, an electron microscope picture of it. And notice how it looks very mechanical-like in structure. And this is something they've been studying because actually it kind of works the same way that our motors kind of work um, when it comes to like our vehicles and boats. So here you kind of see that structure. Notice this would be looking like possibly, uh, a, this would probably definitely be a um, gram negative. Uh, a gram-negative bacteria, because notice we have a peptoglycan and then we have that extra outer covering uh, of the cell wall. Okay, so when it comes to bacteria, we know that they could divide asexually. In other words, they could do binary fission. We studied that, they just split into two new cells. But bacteria can also do sexual reproduction. In other words, they can get genetic variation. And there's three ways they could get genetic variation. There's transformation, and transformation is when bacteria will just pick up a piece of DNA from the environment. DNA are floating around, there might be some random piece of DNA just floating around and they could absorb it, incorporate it into their chromosome and boom, now they have some genetic variation. So there's transformation, there's transduction. That's where bacteria cells can obtain DNA via a vector, usually a virus. And guys, we just saw pictures of that, how a virus could actually inject DNA that, get, that, could, that could get incorporated into the bacterial chromosome. And now it's gonna be genetically different. So that's another way you could get genetic variation. And then you have conjugation. 
that is bacterial sex. Now, for this to occur, one of the bacteria has to have a pili or a pilus, I'm sorry, pili is the plural form. And usually for them to have a pilus or pili to form, they have to have this extra piece of DNA, uh, usually found in a plasmid form, but not necessarily called an F factor, where the F stands for fertility. So this is known as a fertility factor. You need that factor in order to form a pilus, in order to form uh, these pili that you could use for conjugation. So let's look at some pictures of these. So here is transformation. So notice we have our bacteria cell. Notice we have our different genes here. You have A, B, C, D, E. We have our circular chromosome. Here's some random pieces of DNA just floating around in the environment. And bacteria can just take it up. They could absorb this DNA. And notice we have genes A and B, but they're uppercase. So maybe they're uh, a dominant gene or something. And now they could be incorporated into that chromosome, possibly some of it gets degraded, but now you see some recombinant or we see some DNA that is genetically different from the actual parent that it, before it picked it up. So this could definitely lead to genetic variation. So once again, this is transformation. Here's transduction. Once again, this is where a virus you know, inserts its DNA into a bacterial cell, yeah, and then it could incorporate it into another bacteria and usually in that lysogenic state, and now it's gonna be genetically varied. So transduction, it's gonna use a virus to get that genetic variation. And then here you have conjugation. This is bacterial sex, where once again, one of them has to be able to form a sex, a sex pilus or pili, and it could only do that if it has this right here. This would be the F factor, the fertility factor right here that allows it, I'm sorry, my bad. This right here is the fertility factor. This right here allows it to make that pillus. Notice it connects to the other cell. It could make a copy of the fertility factor, pass it over, and boom, now it's going to have some genetic variation. And now it's actually turned this one into a fertility. It's turned it into one that can now form a pillus itself. So let's look at that. Let's look at conjugation a little bit closer. Um, actually, here's another picture. This is actually a real picture using an electron microscope. And notice there, the six plus, um, sex pellets or pili definitely has a range for it to connect to another cell, send copies of DNA over. Okay, so looking at this F factor, that fertility factor can be a plasmid. So cells containing an F plasmid kind of function as a DNA donor because they're the ones that can form a pillus. So they're gonna form a pillus connected to another cell and then make a copy of that fertility factor, some genes, and then transfer those genes over, giving genetic variation to that other cell. Or that F factor, that fertility factor, can be built into the chromosome. It doesn't have to be separate in a plasmid. Now, if it's built into the chromosome, we call it an HFR, or high frequency fertility factor the recipient becomes the recombinant bacteria uh, with DNA from two different cells. So let's look at a picture of this. So notice first up here, we have an F plus cell. F plus means that they have the fertility factor. They're able to form a sex pillus. Here we have an F minus cell. This means they don't have a fertility factor. Notice how they don't have that extra piece of DNA, no plasmid, no fertility factor. This one will form the sex pillus connected to this cell. Notice how it makes a copy of the fertility factor, sends it over, and now it changed this F minus cell into an F plus because now, it has that extra piece of DNA, so the recipient has become genetically varied. It has some new DNA. It could now form a sex pillus. Where this one here is showing an HFR. So notice here, right there in blue, that is our fertility factor. Notice it's not separate in a plasmid. It's actually built into the actual bacterial chromosome. Well, it could still make a sex pillus. Notice here we have an F minus cell where it doesn't have a fertility factor. It could send copies. It could make a copy of that chromosome, send it over. It could be incorporated into the cell. And now you have this F minus that's a recombinant kind of cell. It is genetically varied. Now, it not, might not necessarily get the fertility factor. Sometimes it might not send the entire fertility factor over, but it will send some DNA of this cell over. So now this has become pretty much a recombinant kind of bacteria. It could remain F minus. Sometimes it could become F plus, depending if it gets that entire fertility factor. So hopefully that wasn't all too confusing. Hopefully you're understanding this. 
Now, last thing I want to mention, there's other types of plasmids. So that was an F plasmid. It could be an F plasmid. It could be also incorporated into the DNA. Uh, but you also have something called R plasmids. The R stands for resistance plasmids, antibiotic resistance plasmids. They carry genes for antibiotic resistance. In other words, remember, antibiotics are these medicines we can use to kill, back, uh, kill bacteria. But if bacteria have these R plasmids, they could become, they, they have resistance. They have the genes that make the resistance towards these antibiotics. So antibiotics kill sensitive bacteria, but not bacteria with specific R plasmids. Through natural selection, the fraction of bacteria with genes for resistance increases in a population exposed to antibiotics. And we kind of see that. Notice that you know, one of our most popular antibiotics is penicillin, but nowadays penicillin doesn't work on very many bacteria because most bacteria already out there are resistant to penicillin. So antibiotic resistant strains of bacteria are becoming more and more common. That's why we have to be careful on how we use our antibiotics. So, that's pretty much the end of our part two of our lecture for bacteria and viruses. Guys, I can't stress enough, do the Khan Academy lessons. I actually added a new video for you guys to check out on the lytic and lysogenic cycles on there. Um, guys, go back if you want, chapter 19, read a little bit more about retroviruses. But guys, hopefully you've got a basic understanding. You're ready for the quizzes on Thursday. Once again, the quizzes is our mid-week knowledge check. And don't forget our actual and moto quiz will be on Monday. So guys, if you have questions, you have concerns, send me in moto messages, send me an email, reach out on Instagram, make sure that you just reach out, make sure you get that knowledge and be ready for the quizzes. Well guys, hopefully this has become, hopefully this was helpful for your understanding. Um, and guys, uh, last thing once again, just reach out if you need any help with your distance learning. Well guys, at this time, go ahead and have yourself an awesome day.